special project at the Mirrorwood Centre, and I am delighted to welcome all of you here today to join this important conversation. And I especially want to welcome our guest, Dr. Smith, and thank her so much for agreeing to do this for us. Dr. Smith, Judy Smith is the Assistant Dean of Undergraduate Program at the Goldfarb School of Nursing. And her work is, is, is very much focused on the impacts of aging and the accompanying loss is util and she's to pre approaches this using a biopsychological social approach. Her interests include loneliness, dementia and delirium and how those common geriatric syndromes impact the holistic health of older adults. And as we were saying to each other a few minutes before you all joined us, these are particularly trying and lonely times for all of us, but in particular for members of the senior population, many of whom live alone and isolated lives to begin with. Her work is, is really impressive. Those of you who are interested, we can share with you her list of publications. She's done extensive research. She has extensive reports and studies concluded under her name and a publication list that runs over two pages on which I'm not going to try and read you, only because there are lots of psychological terms that I don't think I'm going to be able to pronounce properly. But I do know that we are extremely honored and extremely happy to have you here, Dr. Smith, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, hopefully. Um, let's see, so I need to start from the beginning. Okay, so today, I'm I, again, thank you so much. And I wanna thank Dr. Kathy Cush for introducing me to um, the Mirrorwood Center. I'm very honored to be talking today. What I'm going to be talking about for the next 45 minutes, I want to be focusing on, I'm going to kind of give a re, uh, summary of my research on loneliness in older adults, and then we're going to kind of segue into how the whole COVID pandemic crisis has really impacted loneliness, social isolation, and the older adult. And this is really near and dear to my heart. So um, I really thank you for inviting me today. Okay, so just to kind of get started, who am I? Um, I am the Assistant Dean at Goldfarb School of Nursing. I have been at Goldfarb since 2003. I started as a faculty member. My background is I am a nurse, of course. I have a master's in gerontological nursing, which I love older adults. And then um, prior to academia, I was the clinical nurse specialist on the psychiatric unit. So that's really sort of a lot of what shaped my interest in loneliness and older adults because my experience in working with those uh, older adults with psychiatric mental health illnesses were oftentimes lonely, anxious, depressed, scared. So I really, that really made an impact on how um, I formulated my dissertation. So I got my uh, PhD at St. Louis University. I completed that in 2010. And loneliness was the, uh, my area of interest. I really, um, I, I love it. I'm still interested in it. And I, I think it's a really clinically relevant topic, not just for older adults, but for all of us, because uh, loneliness is a universal, universal phenomenon. So I'm the assistant dean. I'm a nurse. I'm a researcher. But I'm also a mother, a daughter, and a grandmother. So I uh, did email my daughters yesterday to make sure I had permission to share their pictures. So, and in the spirit of Halloween, I don't know if you can see on the left side of the screen, this is my old, I don't know if you can see the pointer. This is my older daughter, Catherine, who's in a, she's dressed in a cowboy outfit. Um, she is now 33 and she's um, an, an oncologist at Washington University. And interestingly enough, she is studying loneliness in uh, breast cancer. Uh, clients. My younger daughter, Madeline, who is the pumpkin, you can see that she is a certified public accountant. She has her master's degree. She got her master's at Washington University, and she works at one of the big firms, KPMG. 
So I'm very proud of both my daughters and I'm just so thrilled that they're here to uh, join me today. Um, this is my mother who is 91 years old, or let's say this 91 years young. She has also been a major influence in my life. And this is little Jake, my grandson. Uh, and then over here, I don't know if you can see the two in the spirit of Halloween, uh, my grandchildren, Jake and Cora, who are dressed in Halloween. <laughs> Those are Catherine's uh, children. Okay, so let's get started then. I want to also now, before we get started, who I want to hear from you all. Um, I understand that some of you are in the audience are professional professionals. If I kind of want to give a shout out. When I was speaking with um, Stephen yesterday, he mentioned that there were going to be some social work professionals in the audience. Uh, you may be caregivers, you may be students, you may be older adults, um, but I just wanted to recognize that and feel free to uh, add a comment in the chat if you want or speak up if you have any questions or comments. Um, so we're going to get started then by talking a little bit about my research and how it came to be. Uh, let's see. Oops. Okay. So, so today, as I kind of summarize, we're going to talk about my research that I did completed for my dissertation, and then we'll kind of segue into the coronavirus and how it has impacted loneliness and the aging. Okay. So loneliness, why is it important to study loneliness? Loneliness is important. It has a really, uh, it affects the entire health of one's being both physically, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually. Uh, John Cacioppo, who was a researcher at University of Chicago, unfortunately, he died in his 60s um, unexpectedly, but I was actually reading up, his wife wants to continue his research on loneliness, but he did a lot of work on loneliness and the, the physiological health of loneliness and how it's impacted one, and it really increases the risk of mortality. And a lot of older adults, a lot of people in general are reaching out to uh, the health services for more, uh, more help because of the loneliness. This is a graphic that I found and it kind of speaks to Cacioppo's work how the loneliness truly does physiologically impact one's health. So some are comparing it to smoking. And you know what we learned about, what we now know about smoking is the, all the detrimental effects. So loneliness is really sort of like the new smoking that it impacts a lot of the physiological symptoms. You can see blood pressure, immune response, increasing harmful habits, such as uh, people might reach to drugs or alcohol because they're feeling lonely and it's loneliness is a stigma. So people are feeling guilty. They don't wanna necessarily report this. And as I talked about before, uh, people are seeking more health, help in healthcare and the increases in mortality. Okay, so other uh, impacts of loneliness, it really not only impacts our physiological health, but mental health as well. And that's really what I found in my uh, clinical experience with working with older adults on the psychiatric unit, that these, these older adults were scared and they were anxious and depressed and, uh, you know, one older patient actually literally had a respiratory arrest because she was so anxious. She was so lonely. She just worked herself up into such a frenzy that she stopped breathing. So it truly is an epidemic in our society. And I think this is something that's clinically relevant and worth studying more of. Okay, so um, when I worked on my dissertation, I really uh, had to develop some aims and the aims and any research is really what the objectives, meaning what goals do we want to achieve when we're studying um, our content of topic. So my study was a qualitative study. So I was really looking at more of um, exploration and really getting into the understanding of the meaning of loneliness. So the first aim of my study, I wanted to describe how older adults living in the community experience loneliness in their everyday lives. I also wanted to explore the coping practices of the community dwelling older adults associated with loneliness. And then lastly, I wanted to discover how the perceptions of loneliness affect the health and well-being of community dwelling older adults. So 
you know, basically I wanted to really get down to understanding what did loneliness look like to people and then how do they cope? Okay, so as I mentioned, my study was a qualitative study. It was an interpretive phenomenological study based on Martin Heidegger, who was one of the, he wrote um, the study of time and being, and it was like one of the greatest works in the 20th century. So uh, really digging down into how we get at understanding human beings and how they, uh, how they are in the world. It's like the lived experience. So in order to get to that, to achieve those aims of, you know, really understanding loneliness, I had worked with my chair to develop three face-to-face -face interviews with each participant. So what that meant is, you know, and of course this was pre-COVID times, but I would physically drive to each participant's home. And we'll talk again about all the details of the study that of course I had to get IRB consent before this happened. So what I was looking for, these were my inclusion criteria, which meant this is how I determined who I wanted to be in my study. So I was looking at over the age of 70. I wanted them to be able to speak English. They definitely had to screen positive for loneliness. So in other words, um, I, you know, I wanted them to acknowledge that they had been lonely within the last six months. Uh, scoring less on the short blessed test, which is a, uh, one of the studies that Washington University recommended that I use for cognition. And then less, on the ger ten, less than 10 on the geriatric depression scale. Um, and this was important because I really did not want to confound depression with loneliness. A lot of times I know, um, you know, when we talk about loneliness, a lot of times people think, oh, that's depression. Well, those are two separate constructs. So I really did not want to confound that. And I really did not want to get into the issue if someone was suicidal or depressed or maybe taking medication. I really did not want that to cloudy the waters of what I wanted to look at in my study. Okay, so those were my inclusion criteria. So next recruitment, how did I recruit my, uh, my sample size? So I used a variety of recruitment methods, and this was something, uh, if I tell, we, we now have a PhD program at uh, Goldfarb, and um, any advice that I like to give our students is that recruitment is one of the toughest parts of the study. It's really challenging getting your population. You never know what you know until you go through it. So um, I had several uh, good, great avenues, but what I ended up finding out was the word of mouth was probably the best method of recruiting. So for example, I had a colleague who said, oh, my aunt is she, I really think she's lonely. You might want to talk to her. So it's really just a matter of persevering when you recruit your uh, clientele. So for example, Meals on Wheels, uh, my idea was to have a flyer that when the uh, volunteers would go deliver meals to the older adults living independently in their home, would have a flyer, you know, just saying, hey, are you interested in um, participating in this study? So I actually got one person through, through that route. So it's a slow process. You just have to keep persevering. <clears throat> so my sample size, who did I end up? I ended up with 12 participants total. And again, because this was a qualitative study, that's a pretty good sample size. Uh, eight women and four men ranging between the ages of 74 and 98 years old. Six of these participants had children. Seven of them lived alone. Some were married, some were single, some were widowed. I had two nuns in my study and the education ranged from seventh grade to postdoctoral degree. So it's just an, an interesting point I wanna remark is I did have a couple that they were both in my study, you know, they were married and they were lonely. So. I think there's a misnomer out there that, oh, well, just because, you know, if I'm married, I'm going to be happy and fulfilled. You know, a lot of people can be alone and be lonely, or they can be lonely in a crowd. So um, th those are just some variables that, you know, doesn't mean that you have to be um, alone and feel lonely or vice versa. Okay, so my tools that I used to collect my data, I had demographic items just, you know, ranging from sex, age, uh, education, et cetera. 
The UCLA loneliness scale was the tool that I used after doing a lot of research. And um, the reason that I used that tool was it was the most widely recognized and it was recommended by the John Hartford uh, scholarship program. And they, are, they, they specialize in geriatrics. So I thought that was a good tool at the time. Looking back on it, um, it was a kind of a cumbersome tool to use. But again, it's one of those things in research you don't know until you go through it. So um, just as an example, the first, my very first participant, when I was asking her the question, she's like, this is, these questions, I don't like these questions. So um, there, it's 20 items and, it's, and some of them are redundant, but I think it was designed that way on purpose to kind of validate and verify the responses. And then the qualitative interviews, which I developed uh, with the help of my chair. Okay, so my interviews consisted of a history interview, a coping interview, and a loneliness interview, and a daily life interview. So these were all, um, these interviews were, I'll talk about, you know, the, the three visits, but basically I wanted to get a background and a context of my participants. I wanted to find out how they coped when they were feeling lonely, what loneliness looked like to them, and what was their daily life? What did it look like? Uh, the field notes, what that means is after each interview, I would go back to my car. I would literally go back to my car and jot down notes on my observations, what the environment looked like, um, you know, what, what was there anything different or unusual about the situation. So for example, some of my participants had dogs that were barking and that was could be a distraction. Um, some of my clients had somebody cutting the grass in the background that could be a distractor. So just any little thing that I thought that was significant at the time. Okay, so my three visits then, again, so you can see this was, I, you know, in retrospect, I'm very appreciative of my education at St. Louis University because I feel like it was a very rigorous program and I did have to do these three visits. Um, very, it, it literally took me the entire summer just that I took the summer off of work to get these visits done. But in hindsight, it was a great, great experience um, because it really helped develop the breadth and knowledge of what I was looking for. So these are sort of the items I used on my first visit. Again, kind of getting a background of that uh, particular participant. The second visit, I explored the loneliness and how they felt about that and how do they cope with loneliness. And then the third visit was again, just to kind of revalidate and reinsure what was going on, just to kind of add to the breadth and the depth of their experience. And this picture of an empty chair, I just had to pick this because it reminded me one of my participants who was a widow, one of her comments was, uh, she, I'll never forget it. She's talked about after she, her husband died and she had to go to a wedding and she felt like, you know, she was sitting alone at this table, all the other couples. And, you know, she just kept looking at the empty chair where her husband would have been. And she said she ended up going to the bathroom and started crying because it just was too much. And then she left the wedding. But to me, that was just, it just really struck me because that, that metaphor of the empty chair was really a phenomenon for her. It was really, that's how she described and that's what, you know, how she embodied her loneliness. Okay, so those were the three visits. Um, what I found then in my findings, and, you know, again, I'm kind of giving you an overview of my work, but, you know, overall the findings that these engagements, like this sense of connectedness with other human beings, they were disrupted and they were disrupted because of a number of reasons declining health. So um, for example, one of my older adult uh, participants, she said, you know, she had a, she did not like to wear her hearing aid because it made her feel old. Um, some of the, my participants, uh, she had to use a walker uh, because her mobility was declining. Uh, a couple of my participants talked about giving up the car and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Retirement was another huge theme and loss of a shared world. You know, so thinking about the widow or widower who lost their lifelong partner, it was a huge deal. Again, this population, uh, you know, marriage was forever. And so they, you know, this was a loss of a shared world that they uh, 
uh, had shared together. Okay, so here, these are some excerpts of some of my uh, favorite participants. I guess not really favorite, but when I say favorite, I mean paradigm cases. And what I mean by that is a paradigm case, they really uh, exemplified and embodied the loneliness concept. So Audrey, my, and, and these are all pseudonyms of my client participants. So these are not their real names. That was to protect their, you know, anonymity. So Audrey, my participant, who was a very sharp 90-year-old widow, she would drive herself to banks, to the beauty shop. She was, she was quite an amazing woman, but she talked about her feelings of loneliness. And she said, yeah, I cut down. I used to go to the beauty shop and then every week, and I don't like going anymore. I don't like doing anything. It's hard for me to walk around the beauty shop. I have to use a walker. I go in there and I have a winter coat on and they don't help me take it off. They don't realize it's just down the hall, but it's like a hundred miles to me. You know what I mean? So again, this woman was very active and her you know, declining mobility, her declining health was really impacting how she felt. One of my nuns, again, this is a pseudonym, her name, her, her real name was not Grace, but I named her Grace. She talked about her feeling of loneliness as a feeling of being left out because I can't hear. Sometimes when the three of us pray together, we tend, my friend, she, that was her name, I didn't want to mention the name, tends to be very introspective. And when she shares, she doesn't do it very loudly. And I don't hear her and I do sometimes feel left out and I can feel lonely. So those were some themes from some of my adults and then giving up the car as I had sort of alluded to already. Half of my participants no longer drove the car. Many of them talked about they were worried um, that they were gonna have an accident. They were worried about um, the cars whizzing by and it really stressed them out. And one of my participants used, she said, she actually said she felt lonely when it was pouring down rain and she had to turn the windshield wipers on and that just really made her feel isolated and scared. So driving was a big, huge theme. And as you probably all are aware, um, transportation is a big deal. So, and that's kind of common sense. If you can't drive to where you want to be, that really takes away the independence and it impairs your ability to, to connect and stay uh, engaged with others. Okay, Jonathan was one of my male uh, participants. And as you can see, he was 90 year, 98 years young, very still living independently in his home. Uh, he did have Martha's hands come to visit him and help out with some of his ADLs or activities of daily living. But he was a really interesting person to meet because he retired, but then he got bored. So he got another job quickly. <laughs> so, um, this was his perspective. He said, yep, I've always had responsibility, which I've always welcomed. I like responsibility. And that's one of my troubles now. I don't have much responsibility for anything. My girls don't depend on me. Nobody else depends on me that I know of. So he, a lot of the older, and interestingly, a lot of the older men, I only had four in my study, but they were much more focused on their job and how that I, how they identified with their self-worth with their job. So again, keeping in mind the context of the scenario, these, uh, you know, back in their generation, uh, the men, it was more likely that the men were working versus the women. So the men, these four men were very much, their job was very tied up with their self-worth and their identity. Okay, so an, another major theme was widowhood. And obviously, loneliness, the, the, the remaining partner is going to experience that loss and feel lonely. They were no longer, a couple of them really expressed how, oh, gosh, I just can't share that morning cup of coffee or the newspaper with my husband or wife because it's, they're no longer there. So that really was a major theme. Um, Sally, who was another one of my uh, participants who was a widow, she was, you know, it was apparent to me that her husband was her best friend because she said, uh, she was kind of speaking of him when she said, who understands you more than anybody? Now, if my friends don't understand me, the girl that is really my best friend, we've been together since we were three. 
We practically know the ins and outs of everything, but the loneliness is from the lack of support and lack of understanding and just having somebody there for you. So again, you know, just feeling that loss of the partner and sort of that emptiness. Okay, so another theme that um, emerged was the re-engaging with others to restore those disrupted connections. So again, as I explored the second aim of, you know, what do you do to help that helps with your loneliness? Many of my participants, and you see the picture of the woman with the dog, that was a huge theme, really, the pet therapy. And that's actually been validated in the literature, how pets can really help reduce uh, blood pressure, help feeling um, that sense of belonging and being needed. So that's really important. Others um, talked about volunteering. There's a lot of in literature about the importance of volunteering and now that really makes one feel important or you know feel, makes one feel needed, I guess I should say. So um, many of my participants talked about the, you know they would get on the phone, call a, a family member, just trying to um, forgetting oneself. So, uh, you know, not necessarily focusing on their own needs, but trying to reach out and help others. And that, that also is validated in the literature. And it's kind of common sense that someone is thinking about others and how they can help other people, they're not necessarily focusing on themselves. And we've talked about volunteering. Uh, there's, um, uh, that's a, there's quite a bit of literature again on the importance of volunteering and to get out of oneself. I quoted the, one of my participants. She said that um, that really made her again, get out of thinking that kind of dwelling in her low moods and she would get out and help others. And that would help herself to feel needed. One of my participants volunteered at the YMCA. And so that was really um, also um, a great coping mechanism for her. Okay, um, this is another quote from another one of my participants. Her name was Helen. And Helen uh, was a really busy in her prime years. She was married with eight children. So imagine all your children growing up and her husband was deceased. So there was nothing. She was left with a cat. And so she said, well, she, the cat is always there for me. She's never out and she'll come up and rub against me. She wants to be petted and it's something there that cares. Do you know what I mean? When you get to feeling down sometimes and after you raise all those children that I did, it's kind of hard to be alone. She's my buddy. So I'm actually thinking about this woman and I still remember you know, her family, even though she was a widow living on independently on her own, um, the day that I first went to meet her, it was kind of sweet because her granddaughter was there too. I think she wanted to check me out to make sure I wasn't some scam artist or something like that. But that, that actually made me feel good too because I showed the granddaughter my card and this was legitimate. This was a legitimate study. And so the daughter, the granddaughter did stay while I interviewed Helen for the first time, but that's okay because it, it shows that this woman was cared for. Okay, so other ways of coping that some of my participants talked about, going outdoors. And I think about this a lot. Um, I'll think about how you all feel when you get outside, get some fresh air. It just really can change your mood. So a lot of my participants talked about that. They would feel maybe low or down or, and if they got outside, uh, it just really changes your whole perspective to see, get some fresh air and, you know, uh, get out of those four walls. That's what my, one of my participants said. He's like, I got to get out of those, these four walls. So I think that was a good way of summing it up. So other hobbies, you know, a lot of my participants talked about playing cards, uh, bingo, or you could see mahjong. So just games, cards, activities, anything that was meaningful for them. I mean, we, I think it, it's important as caregivers that we can't prescribe something. It has to be important for that person. So one person might enjoy reading a book or one person might enjoy playing bingo. So it's really we have to really be important to individualize the uh, extracurricular hobbies. Okay, another kind of theme that I came up with is, is that emerged from my research was that loneliness, loneliness was embodied. 
which what does that mean? That means that it was lived through the body in many different ways. So oftentimes when I, that was one of my sort of standard questions I would ask my participants is how does your body feel? And I remember if first thing, you know, this is kind of a weird question, but um, my chair really encouraged me to ask that. And it was very interesting how a lot of times the participants said, I feel tired. I just feel tired. And a couple of them said, I just want to go to bed. I want to sleep. So it really, to me, shows that it's not just a psychological uh, phenomenon. It really impacts the physiological uh, aspects of the person. So I kind of like this quote is that feeling when you are not necessarily sad, but you just really feel empty. And a lot of my, that was another theme that kind of emerged too with that emptiness, that feeling of emptiness. One of my participants talked about, she described herself feeling as a vacuum, that she just felt empty. Okay, so in summary, um, from my study, I, you know, realized that loneliness is really is a problem of epidemic proportions. And many of my participants experienced loneliness as a result of those disrupted engagements that they were unable to connect with those loved ones. Older adults coped by re-engaging, whether it be with a pet or with a, uh, a neighbor or um, another family member. Okay, so that's that was sort of my, does anybody, I, maybe I'll stop here to see if anybody has any questions. And if not, I can just keep going and we can talk at the end. I've got a couple more slides. I'm gonna kind of talk now, a uh, segue into COVID. So kind of talking about COVID and the impact of loneliness and aging, which has really, you know, unfortunately become a whole, uh, has really become, you know, changed our whole world and how we see things and how we do things. And we never, we may never get back to exactly how we were. So, um, so COVID, uh, these are some recent studies that talk about how COVID, the spread of coronavirus disease, in case I'm, I'm, I'm certain everybody has heard of COVID, but um, that's sort of the acronym for coronavirus disease 2019 has led to statewide emergency declarations and social distancing mandates. Unfortunately, we are all aware of that. And that evidence is mounting that absence of social connection contributes to mortality from cardiovascular events and cancer. Okay, so this pandemic has, again, mandated social distancing, stay-at-home orders, visitor restrictions and long-term care facilities in order to protect those most vulnerable. And you know, currently, there's still we're still learning a lot about coronavirus, but um, the age was a big risk factor for um, this pandemic, as well as comorbid conditions. And Malone, the article in 2020 talked about um, the COVID is a geriatric health emergency, which uh, you know you hate to be an alarmist, but that was something that really struck me that this is a serious problem and this is something we need to be aware of. So you know the social distancing can lead to, you know, really heighten those feelings of loneliness, which can also add to the physical and mental decline in health. So it's all sort of unfortunately a circular. Um, compounding factor. So social isolation, COVID and social isolation. So again, it's a public health threat. The potential to increase ageist views. So that's what one of the uh, authors talked about, which unfortunately our society already is, uh, the stigma of aging is unfortunately there. Whether we like it or not, we, we do our best to try to uh, uh, de decrease that stigma, but this can potentially uh, increase it. And it impacts those older adults because really it is impairing their interactions with friends and family. And I might ask her, doctor, I might ask Dr. Kush to elaborate that when we have our discussion because she's probably seen it firsthand as a nurse practitioner visiting those clients that they are really um, restricted from visitors. And it's really, I can't even imagine the loneliness and isolation. That's really a, probably a whole nother topic. Um, so that has really impacted our world. So again, this, so the whole concept of social isolation 
that it really impairs one's ability to, you know, the stimulation of the brain. And that um, there was a study that talked about the, if, if there's no stimulation, if the person is just sort of living inside without interaction, they can really be at risk for more cognitive decline. And it really kind of makes sense too that if, if the brain is a, a muscle just like any of our other organs. So if, if the person is not exercising these muscles, they're gonna be at risk for cognitive decline. And again, this is an under-recognized risk. So loneliness was sort of a, you know, I remember when I started talking about studying it, my one of my professors is like, well, why do you want to study that? Isn't that negative? Isn't that depressing? But it really is a reality, and I think we need to address it. And so the whole interaction of social isolation and loneliness is really bi-directional. Okay, so what can we do to help? So kind of in summary. As nurse, from a nursing perspective, we really do look at the holistic person. We look at the biopsychosocial aspects of our patients. We can help them to reminisce about the good days and sharing pictures and photo albums, helping them to remember what their purpose is. And we can help them to re-engage and connect. Uh, technology is really a huge driver in our society. Uh, so, Tele telehealth is really has been around for a while, but that's really being catapulted. I think we're really going to be focusing more on that with uh, increased use of technology. And again, some I think I was talking previously to Judith and Stephen how you all are teaching about that, which is great because I think this is definitely going to be a tool that will help to help reestablish those connections. And the ego integrity, that is um, Eric Erickson's eight stages of developmental stages, that the older adult is really uh, charged with the ego integrity versus despair. So if they can't achieve that ego integrity, then they are going to be at risk for feeling despair. So the, these tools and platforms can really help to cultivate that in integrity, that feeling of self-worth and purpose. Okay, so in conclusion, I kind of like this quote by George Bernard Shaw. He says, we do not stop working and playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop working and playing. And I think that really pretty much sums it all up because, um, you know, there's always those myths of retirement that they're gonna, people are gonna be happy and do whatever they want, but you really have to have a plan and stay active, both physically and mentally in order to continue to be successful in your day-to-day -day life. So I just wanted to say thank you everybody and I'll open it up for questions or discussion. And I have my contact information here. If you want to reach out to me, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So either you can raise your hand or you can type a chat. Um, however you would like, unmute yourself, um, or I can unmute you if you would like to ask a question, um, please let me know. Um, we can certainly, Judy is ready and waiting to answer any questions you may have. Dr. Smith, I don't have a question at the moment, but I just something that really struck me that you said in your presentation was um, the assumption that a couple um, aren't necessarily lonely, like a, like a married couple. And that, that was very profound. Um, I hadn't really considered that before. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, because, you know, it's really interesting you said that, is it Shelby? Shelby, yes, because you know, there's that assumption that, oh, well, they're married and they, they're happy, happily married and they, they're happy and content, but they may be happily married or they may not be, but the person can certainly be um, with another partner or spouse uh, and, and still feel that isolation and emptiness. So uh, I, think, I think that's a great comment because people don't, I actually had other people comment, well, gosh, they're married, why would they be lonely? You know, so that's, that's really true. So do we have other questions? I have a question, Dr. Smith. Yes. If, 
are, are you still continuing doing research in this field? Well, thank you for asking. I, um, so thanks to Dr. Kathy Cush, who, I don't know if she's still here. I can't see everybody in the yeah. audience, but, oh, there you are. <laughs> she is, <laughs> we are, uh, we work together at Goldfarb School of Nursing and really we're both in administrative roles now, but we really, it's such a passion. Um, and she sort of helped me to stay on task I do think, you know, we, we really do want to continue. And I don't, I will let Kathy, Dr. Kush add to that because this is a great, I think this is really an important topic and we want to continue, or, you know, exploring that. So Dr. Kush, do you want to add to that? Sure, thank you. First of all, I'm honored to work with Judy, Dr. Smith. Um, kind of like her, I probably, in my previous research, especially as a geriatric nurse practitioner, I don't think I would have ever considered loneliness, but fairly recently I do a lot of work as a nurse practitioner and I see hospice individuals. And with the changes related to the pandemic, I started noticing this abject loneliness. Family members aren't able to visit. Um, people are dying alone, to be honest. Uh, one day recently, my daughter was almost in tears. She drove by an assisted living facility and she said, mom, there's this older gentleman with an umbrella and he's standing outside somebody's window trying to make a visit. And it just breaks my heart. So knowing that Dr. Smith had this research, we had this aha moment and um, I persuaded her <laughs> along with another research colleague. So we are going to be, uh, we are working on a new research project where we're trying to look at loneliness and what interventions there are. And we haven't quite got it all together, but one of the aspects might be how do healthcare providers recognize that it is a problem and what are we gonna do about it? Um, and you know, take it into multiple disciplines. So we're still in the baby stages as it were. So hopefully we get things going pretty fast and We'll be looking for participants and hopeful that uh, some of you would consider being a uh, part of our study. So thank you. Judy, could you put yes. that could you put that quote by Shaw up again? Sure. Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> get back to that. Can you are you am I still sharing the screen? No, well, go ahead and share again. Okay. Let's see. Oh boy. Let me see here. <laughs> this is the page and then I have to share it. Right. From current slide. Go okay, to the now. bottom of your screen and share screen. Uh, okay, wait a minute. Okay. Let's see. It's not letting me share. Um, you should be able to. Uh, let me do this. Or say it again slowly. I've got oh, here. I'll just. We do not stop working and playing because. <laughs> uh, and I can also send you these slides, but let's see. We do not stop working and playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop working and playing. Okay, thank you. Sure. And this, this, uh, this is recorded, so you can, you'll be able to see this again if you missed it or if you wanted to hear it again. We'll have it on the website for you. And Judy, you had a couple of other documents you had sent to me mm -hmm. that may be of interest. So if you wanted to talk a moment about what you had sent to me. Sure. Um, I had sent a few articles that I published. Um, I, um, my, I call it my flagship article was it's called Towards a Better Understanding of Loneliness in Community Dwelling Adults. 
And my, actually, my older daughter had told me, I think I got 78 hits on it or something like that. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know that. Um, it, it, but what that told me was that it, it the there's lots of descriptive studies on loneliness and quantitative studies, but this was, a, as I said before, a qualitative study. So, um, and maybe that's my background as a psych mental health nurse that I really wanted to have these interviews and understand, the, really try to understand that meaning of loneliness. So that was sort of my, my beginning article. And then I kind of spun off some other articles where I did some, I talked about Audrey, who was again, a pseudonym, but my paradigm case of loneliness and, um, you know, just how uh, she felt about that. Um, and then another article I talked about was portraits of loneliness. And if I really had stuck on the research track, I ended up, you know, in leadership and administration, but I can see how, you know, you really have to think about the next steps and how um, loneliness, as I said, it can be a universal phenomenon. So it can apply, you know, how do you translate this to other populations like uh, mental health patients? You know, they oftentimes have feelings of loneliness in their, when they're in their depressed phases um, or, you know, not to call out my daughter, but she's studying about, you know, breast cancer and those patients. So there's a lot of ways that we can apply and continue to study about loneliness. And again, with the pandemic, the pandemic has really catapulted our whole society into this uh, isolated mode. You'll, you'll see pictures on, on, you know, TV commercials about people visiting their grandparents and they're only able to see them through the, the glass door, which is really sad. So I really do think, I, I agree with Dr. Kush. I, I think we would love to get more recruitment and uh, you don't, don't want to put anybody on the spot now, but we're, you know, we really would love to explore more. We're, as she said, we're really just kind of in the beginning phases of developing this study with the methodology. I would, we would like to look at some other tools too, to see, you know, what would be appropriate to study like with loneliness. So there's a lots of way to measure loneliness and a lot of it is someone's human perspective. Judy, this is Jan. I, Hi. Just wanted, I just wanted to make a comment that I find I do visit, oh, I'm an end of life doula also. And I find that uh, this one friend that I, visit um he needs to have something to look forward to mm -hmm. i find you know and sometimes it drives you crazy oh well what time are we gonna go what are we gonna but it's i realize that that's so important you know like all of us we like something to look forward to mm -hmm. and if you don't have that it can be like well you know what's the point so i just wanted to make that comment how Thank important you. That, that's really a great point, Jan, because when I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do and how I wanted to shape my dissertation, I remember somebody actually said that exact same thing, that whole anticipation. So mm -hmm. looking forward to somebody coming to visit you. And actually one of my participants, it was so priceless because it, you know, the, my participant, it was a husband and wife, but the husband was the one who was lonely and the wife was the one she was taking care of him because he had Parkinson's mm -hmm. and she was trying to bargain with me. She's like, are you sure you can't come more than three times? You know, would you like to come keep visiting him? He's really looking forward to having you come. So you're exactly right. We all need something to look forward to. We all have something, you know, to work towards in life or otherwise there, you know, we have to have that meaning and purpose in our life. So thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. We have any other questions? I think. Thank you so much. It looks like um, you have a question. Yes, for... you do, Mr. Hyatt. Let me unmute. Is does your research show that by doing that, it would help your loneliness? By, you're talking about the coping mechanisms? Yeah, to, to cope with your loneliness, 
uh, when you go into a senior facility, there's people you probably know at the senior facility, people you have that are have in common, you know, uh, with you, people who maybe you went to school with. Would that help combat loneliness? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, having that sense of belonging and that, se that sense of connection that, you know, that you feel like you have something in common with somebody that you can trust to talk with, that all uh, helps. Now, some people are more extroverted and some are more introverted. So it really is individualized. I think that's a great question because some people might be content to read a book um, as a hobby on their own and they're happy and they don't feel lonely. But some people just feel like they have to be with other people in order to feel fulfilled. So it really can be individualized. Um, great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to, so I, I've talked about my older daughter who's studying uh, loneliness and oncology and my younger daughter was uh, also an inspiration who she talked about, she encouraged me to, this was 10 years ago, why don't I study about these old, you know, really teaching older adults about technology. And of course, I think with COVID, we, you know, that everyone has been sort of forced to use technology, whether they like it or not. Um, so my mother, who's 91, you know, refuses to get a computer. But it's really interesting, though, because she has, uh, she still socializes, she has friends, and they're, a lot of these people are doing Zoom meetings and, uh, you know, uh, meetings on the internet. So it's, you know, whether you like it or not, I think we have to adapt. Does she socialize with her, you know, just like conversation, phone conversations? And how does she keep in touch? She so she's, yeah, she's, she, um, I mean, she's very, uh, still very active. She'll wear her mask. She's very, um, you know, she still engages with talks on the phone, that type of thing. Oh, good. But, mm -hmm. good. Yeah, I think until we can get through, um, well, who knows how much longer, it'll be a long time before we can get out of wearing a mask and social distancing, but it probably has changed our life forever because, I was reading an article where the, the handshake is probably uh, not going to exist anymore. Right. You know, simple things like that that we take, yeah. we took for granted. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Judy. May I just say thank you on behalf of the Mirrorless Center and in thanking you, Dr. Smith, I first think I need to thank Dr. Kush for the introduction because this yeah. is wonderful and enlightening for me certainly and i'm sure for everyone who's participated i will just tell you that if your mother's interested we have a tech tutor program to help people like her to become comfortable with technology and because of the technology we have increasing numbers of people participating in our own programs and she's welcome to join i want to thank our professional colleagues from jfs who joined us and hopefully if they have people who can be referred to you as uh, suitable for your study. I'm sure they'll be assisting you as well. I want to thank everyone who joined us today and encourage you to look at the Facebook page of the Mirrorwitz Center and also our e-blog to see it, learn about our upcoming programs. And once again, so many thanks to you, Dr. Smith, for your lovely and informative presentation. Oh, well, thank you so much. It was my pleasure, and I really appreciated talking with you all today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.